Blog Talk Radio. Are you ready for more propaganda? Well, you're in the wrong place at the right time. Colombo Chronicles is for critical thinkers. Let's welcome the consumer advocate for justice. Here's the Rose. Rose Colombo. Colombo right here for you on Colombo Chronicles every Wednesday from noon to 1 p.m. with very special guests. Once in a while, I do a whole commentary if I'm really upset about something our federal government is doing. But don't tell anyone about that because that's what we're all about, telling the truth on Columbo Chronicles. And today, we have a real truther guest for you. She is a return guest. She's a fantastic author, and she is was born in uh, Alexander, Alexandria, Egypt and to an upper-middle-class family. And she is one of six children, and her name is Layla El Sissi. And Layla is, has a story that will just cause you to be sad and happy and concerned about what happens to young girls who are kind of like sold or bargained or... Uh, into a marriage, which they have no choice to uh, do anything about because the father, I suppose, is the key person who makes the arrangements for the marriage for his daughters. And I guess it could be anybody. It could be a young man, a middle class, uh, upper middle class, poor guy. I I don't know. We're going to find out from her because we are fortunate. We American women are so fortunate to live in a country where we do not have to get married. Although in the past, if you got pregnant, there were those shotgun weddings <laughs> because the parents wanted to give the, um, they they would become grandparents, of course, wanted to give the baby the father's name. And of course, it was a huge embarrassment to the family. And uh, if their daughter got pregnant out of marriage and, uh, even the law, the court didn't even identify the baby as a legal baby, but an illegitimate baby. And the mother, uh, back in the day, uh, couldn't even get child support for the baby because the baby didn't have the father's name. Father didn't acknowledge the baby in those cases. So uh, it's a complicated, it's very complicated uh, when you look at the past to what's happening in the present where anything goes. <laughs> And so we are going to enter into the world of authors and experts in just a moment. If we have time, we'll enter into the Justice Club as well, because that's some real issues here about what the courts are doing. We've almost become a total lawless nation, uh, and it's like uh, these politicians are more concerned about their donations than they are about America and Americans and justice. I'm talking real justice. We haven't had real justice in this country for a very long time. And I can attest to that because (laughs) I have firsthand experience with it. And I have interviewed hundreds of victims of legal abuse who I consulted with so they wouldn't jump off a cliff or commit suicide or whatever. Because when you become a victim of legal abuse, you are alone and isolated. But thanks to Women Fight Back, that was created by the Rose, uh, they had a place to go because we needed to connect. We needed to find each other because we were isolated and alone and nobody wanted to hear our stories, our sad stories. Uh, And they said, we must have done something wrong. Uh, We must have misunderstood the judge or... Uh, the lawyer or whatever, but nobody wanted to believe the real victims of injustices. And so I decided, well, they're going to hear the real stories. And that's what I did. I decided not to have a pity party. And so did our author, Layla Al Sissi. And so we're going to enter into that great world of authors and experts in just a moment. So don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. The Justice Club is back on Colombo Chronicles live podcast. 
Join Rose Colombo at noon and find out what tips she will provide in a world of little justice. Howdy, folks. Just stopped in by my favorite restaurant, the Horseshoe Cafe. I highly recommend the home-cooked hot meals and piping hot coffee. In fact, it reminds me of my mom's home cooking when I was growing up. The customer service is excellent. Be sure to save room for the world's best desserts. Make sure you try a slice of fresh homemade pie. The Horseshoe Cafe is located at 154 East 4th Street in the heart of Benson, Arizona. The Horseshoe Cafe is right outside of Tombstone, Sierra Vista, and Tucson. Sometimes, Patty and Mike stop by to welcome you. The staff at the Horseshoe Cafe looks forward to seeing you. Stop by to eat or relax. Cool down in the desert with a cold beer or your favorite cocktail. That's the Horseshoe Cafe. Oh, and don't tell anyone I told you, but some people think it's haunted. One thing is for sure. Be sure to bring your appetite. That's right. Be sure to bring your appetite. Say hello to Patty. Patty is my sister. Uh, And by the way, um, you will love the homemade apple pie. (laughs) I promise you. It is very popular. It's a landmark restaurant. It's almost 100 years old. It has the original murals. It has the largest illuminated horseshoe across the ceiling in the world. So she's been written up many, many times and for good reasons. And so let's talk about my latest book, Obamasaurus. I want to share my book with you because it is not just a book. It is a message for humanity and for the entire world to wake up and be very concerned about our very existence and your children and your family. And we're all one big family, so we need to take care of each other. So here we go. Obamasaurus, the new book by Rose M. Colombo, is an updated version of a political satire that reflects the political roadmap of today's world, written with an Orwellian twist. Will humanity survive or suffer depopulation or extinction? Obamasaurus by Rose M. Colombo, available at Amazon.com. Colombo Chronicles Live. Colombo is on their trail. Listen up at Colombo Chronicles Live. That's right. Listen up because now I'm going to enter into the world of authors and experts for sure. Layla L. Sissy is our returning guest. She was born in Alexandria, Egypt to an upper middle class family. She is one of six children and her father was an architect who chose to educate his older daughters at a prestigious French convent school, although he was an observant Muslim. As a teenager, Al-Sissi hoped to pursue a career in journalism. However, she and her older sister, Raria, and I'll ask her if that's exactly how to pronounce it, were promised to older men in arranged marriage at a very young age. So let's just get started because this is of human interest. And as I said before, thank God we live in America where forced marriages, I think, are against the law so far <laughs> in our lawless nation. <laughs> so um, let's say hello. Hi. Hi, Layla. How are you? Hi, today? Rose. I'm good. It's Thank good you. How are you? Good to see you. Do we be back? I know. It's been a long while since you wrote your first book, and now we're on the second book, Fate Knocked on My Door. I like the title. It's very in- intriguing. And I'm so glad you wrote it because, Layla, you went through so much in a dip from a different country. But I, before we get into your book, I have some questions about uh, the Middle East because it's so different than America. And I was wondering if you would mind telling us about Egypt and the different classes of people because here we have, as you know, the poor, the middle class, the upper middle class, and the wealthy and the homeless now. So we really have five classes of people. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the family classes of Egypt? Because I noticed that you are from a, um, an upper middle class family in Egypt. So what, what are the differences in those classes in your country that you migrated yeah. from? 
Yeah, okay. In Egypt and in the Arab world in general, you can see um, maybe 10 or 15 or 20 percent of uh, the population. They are um, kind of uh, well to do and they put their kids into uh, foreign uh, schools like English, German, French. And they, have, they are more liberal, but the majority are um, like uh, simple people. They barely earn their everyday living, and they are more uh, following the religion when it comes to women, like they put the burden on honor of women, um, uh, honor of the family on women. And the girl is raised according to their understanding of the religion, because actually the Muslim religion gives uh, freedom to women in the Arab world. Like the woman, when she gets married, she can keep her father's name. She doesn't have to, to follow the name of her husband. And we can see a lot of changes right now. If you look at Saudi Arabia, women are really now getting a lot of their freedom back, the, the freedom that they uh, fought for it. Like a woman can drive, a woman doesn't need a, a, a man with her if she goes out or uh, as, as a guard or something like that. So in Egypt, when I was uh, raised at that time in Alexandria, my father was educated. He put us in French school, but still the culture and his understanding of the religion forced him to force us into an early marriage. Me and my sister, in one day, he just came and he said, you will be married next Thursday. We couldn't say no because, hello? Oh, yeah, I said, oh my gosh, because um, I was going to ask you uh, that question. I was going to say, so your father was the one who came to you and told you you're going to be married on Thursday, like it or not. How old were you? And also, and your sister, 14 years old. Oh, gosh. And, and my, how old were and my sister? Fifteen. Oh my gosh! And she, how old were the men yeah. that you never met? Uh, Thirty-seven. Were, oh my gosh! Oh god! And so, um, I, so then, what were your feelings at that moment, you and your sister? Well, how did you feel devast- at that moment? You can imagine devastation. Mm-hmm. Like my whole life was turned into a black hole. Like I had ambition to finish school and to be a journalist and to, to uh, you know, uh, recently I met my friends from school and they were telling me that I was a very good writer back then. But I didn't know back then that I was good in writing, you know, when mm-hmm. my life was completely... Um, uh, shattered at that moment, but I had an older sister who was very courageous, very outspoken. She doesn't accept uh, the status quo. She doesn't accept the culture. So she was fighting a lot, and 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 as a result of that, she was beaten a lot by my brother because my brother considered him guardian on our um, virginity and our honor and stuff like that. So um, she helped me. She got her divorce first and she helped me to get mine, but it took me like three years to uh, for um, um, my husband to accept the divorce. And I actually uh, left him on the wedding night. After the ceremony, I my brother helped me to run away with my wedding dress and I went to my aunt. And this is when my um, um, life was completely um, turning uh, into um, uh, several and everyday um, 
issues with my father, with my family. Uh, they wanted me to come back, and I didn't want to. And my aunt, God bless her soul, she is the one who stood by me until I got the divorce. And my sister and I ran away from Egypt. At that so, time, when I was young, mm-hmm. I, I, I didn't understand all the issues of the culture, of the religion, of why my father did that, and where my father comes from, how he was raised, and all this. For me, I was a young girl who saw her father as a tyrant. Now when I am older, I understand more where he is coming from, why he did that. Because, um, you know, in America long ago, uh, women had no rights here either. And you had to wear, you know, the dress from the neck all the way down to the ankles. And the only thing you saw was your hands and your face. If you look at the old movies, you know. And so women had no rights here either. And so you guys are way behind us because women here, back in the day, thank God, began fighting back for some rights, whether it was putting on lipstick, whether it was cutting your hair, whether it was wearing a bathing suit, whether it was, you know, showing your legs or whatever. And so it's been a long struggle for women in America, but it's tougher in your countries from what I read and see because you have so many men who are opposed and into that strict religious political agenda of protecting the women and very young little girls actually and getting them married off uh so uh but in prearranged marriages too on top of it and you're not even old enough to even fall in love so that's no. really a frightening <laughs> situation <laughs> no but, chemistry but I there want to tell you uh, yeah, also, mothers in the Middle East, they raise their sons to be like that, that he is the, the one that he should be served and should be, you know, respected and listened to by the sisters or the women in the family. So it is, it is a, a dilemma for us, you know, that women have to really so many obstacles to reach the freedom that we see here. But even here, uh, women are still not treated equally when it comes to salary, when it comes to position at work. Still, still we have a long way to go, a long way to go as women. It will always be a struggle because um, it is a man's world no matter what. I don't care how many rights women get. It still ends up to be a man's world. And so you have to learn how to be, um, you know, uh, let them think that they have all the all the ideas so you can kind of like get yourself promoted or whatever <laughs> because yeah. it is a man's world. And when you recognize that it's a man's world, no matter how many rights the women have, you go into a court and it's a man's world, you're going to find out. There's very few female judges. And in the past, until recently, there were very few female lawyers and very few female judges and very few women in the legal system and like architects or anything like that as well. And so it's really interesting that the struggle never ends for women, but you have to be kind of careful on how you're pursuing the rights in a country such as yours more than if we were pursuing those rights in our country because we do have more yeah. freedom prote- protection for freedom yeah. than than in right. your country and so um so when you uh so you just you were the runaway bride but you had already said yes i do and you're a runaway bride and you go where and what happens and where did you go after all that did you start no, really. seeking to leave <laughs> egypt yeah. How did you feel? No, I never said, yes, I do, okay? It was a legal marriage, a contract that my father signed on my behalf. Oh, you don't you even see, have to say I yes, I do. Even, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. You don't even get to so, 
I know. I just, when I think about what happened, I laugh now, you know, but it wasn't a laugh. You have to laugh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Yeah. But I, I can't even imagine my father coming home and saying, I just signed a contract and you're going to go live with this man. I'm like, well, I'd run away too. <laughs> but you know what? It's happening a lot. It's happening a lot. And I am listening to this uh, show like yours, you know. She is, but the show I'm, I'm listening to is in Egypt, and the woman is a um, psychologist, and she uh, gets calls from young women. And I couldn't believe how many women are calling to say that their parents got them married and they were underage. And they had to 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 force them into getting married, but um, maybe by falsifying their age or by giving um, doing a kind of marriage that is not authenticated in the court, but they are uh, with two witnesses and uh, they tell each other, I, "I take you as a husband," and I do. You see, people are really messing up with religion they take one word from the 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 book the quran and they make their own story especially when it comes to treating women so it's it's uh it's, it's not difficult only in Egypt. yeah no because uh because uh because of the strict religious people uh you know the 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 people who still believe, those men who still believe in that strict religious uh, belief is because they want total control and power over exactly. the, the women. And they don't want to give it up, you yeah. know. And so it's a really scary situation because, I mean, it's like any government. I mean, even in America, we, we've lost rights, you know, and uh, to like to have secure borders. We no longer have secure borders. People are coming into our country. We don't even know who they are. So, I mean, it's just getting so lawless in this in this country as well as around the world. That, um, but I think if we just keep speaking out and standing up for the law and for what's right, and you know, and marrying little girls off to old men is not right. And so, um, you know, signing a contract for a human being is not right. So I think we just need to keep speaking, speaking out and telling the story. But tell me what happened to you when um, when you finally uh, decided you cannot go back. You have to leave Egypt. What did you do? How did you get out of there? Okay, when my sister got her divorce, she actually was living at my aunt also because we couldn't run away and be in the street. In Egypt, it doesn't happen. So you have to go to a family member. So she met a guy who was as old as my father, but he was from Beirut in Lebanon, and she decided, oh, well, he wants to marry me. Okay, I'll marry him because she wanted to get out. And I was happy as a young girl, and I told her, oh, now you are there. Uh, When I get my divorce, you're going to take me to, to Lebanon too. And that's exactly what happened. You know, I suffered for three years, but then she came and I got my divorce and she took me to Lebanon. This is the where the first book ends. Me and my sister, we are flying to Lebanon. Uh, two teenagers who barely have money experience coming from a very sheltered um, 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 environment and they are just going to to Lebanon and and we went there when I was in Egypt and uh, I was living at my aunt I fell in love with a young man Uh, he met me at the beach and he was also from Lebanon that's why I said I'm gonna go with my sister I didn't know back then that that young man had died in a car accident and my sister wouldn't tell me that. She didn't want me to uh, mourn him all my life. She just told me, oh, he got uh, another girl in Lebanon and and he got married, but it wasn't uh, the truth. Anyway, Um. so the, the second book, 
I called it Fate Knocked on My Door because all my life, every move I made through when I went across three continents, I believe that it was fate that took me to those places, to those people, to, 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 until I ended in, in America, in Canada, then in America. That's why I called it Fate Knocked on My Door, uh, going to Beethoven uh, Symphony 5. Uh, it's called Fate Knocked on My Door as well. So, How did you get to Canada and then to America? Okay, when I was in Lebanon, of course, I couldn't see my mom, and, uh, and it was a very sad farewell, you know, when I left. And uh, when I was in Lebanon, I sent her a letter, and we had a distant uh, cousin who lived in Toronto, in Canada, and I told my mom, please get me his address. So she sent it to me, and I sent to him, and I told him the, my story and what happened. So he immediately, I, that's why I say fate knocked on my door. He sent me the ticket to go to Canada. And uh, when I went to Canada, he had all the paper ready for me to immigrate. At that time, it was very easy to immigrate. And I ended up in Canada. That's how I ended wow. up in Canada. But, but the book has yeah. all the steps I took until I reached Canada. Wow, that is amazing because now you're you're totally away from the country you were born in, your culture, your civilization, your siblings, your uh, parents, your mother. You had a different outlook on your dad. You thought he was a tyrant, which any girl would think. And um, and and it all goes back to the process of politics and religion and and yes. uh, people's interpretations of it. And so, I mean, you can yeah. take any law and interpret it or misinterpret it, depending on who's in office, you know, and yeah. so, or who's in charge of your family or whatever. So that's very interesting that, um, you know, that now you realize that your dad wasn't really a tyrant. He was following his belief system that he was exactly. raised in, in his yeah. environment. And yeah, we can't see that when we're, teenagers that's for darn sure um and and right. so it does take you time to to figure it all out especially when you're under so much stress and pain so while you were going on going through all of this uh, did you did you ever find the love of your life or no um Actually, I was uh, when I was going through the travels from one place to another, I was very scared, very insecure, very inexperienced because my sister in Lebanon, we separated. She wanted to, to force me to get married so I can be with her. And I said no because I wanted to pursue education and leave. And she thought that I was, uh, not strong enough in my personality to pursue this, but I proved I proved myself to be capable. Because, but unfortunately, by the time I achieved all what I wanted, uh, she she passed away. My mother passed away without ever seeing her since I left Egypt, and this this is the sad. A moment in my life that I cannot really erase from my memory and I keep saying that it's because of my father I was not with my mother and uh, it's uh, the book is really full of um, sadness and happiness and and uh, yes, I met a lot of people uh, um, many men Canadian and and Arab, and I was refusing to to connect with any Arab men because of my experience. But uh, to my surprise, I ended up marrying one. 
from Egypt <laughs> as well, not knowing, not knowing at that moment that uh, all men from Egypt, they are raised by the same parent in the same culture, in the same environment, and women for them um, still uh, the way they were raised to see her. I didn't know that. I thought he was here. He was in Canada. He was. Uh, he has been outside for many, many years. But I was wrong. Now I don't think that's that like, you know what you're ingrained in with your childhood, but that has to do with the deep religion roots and uh, and and politics. Uh, I think that's ingrained in people. And it's very difficult to change uh, your belief system that you were raised in over those years. And uh, religion is very deep. And so uh, we've seen, I mean, I met a detective one time when I was um, active with Women Fight Back. He told me that uh, I used to live up on top of the hill in Anaheim Hills in a huge, beautiful home overlooking the city lights. And uh, mm-hmm. there was a neighbor down the street, and they were from Egypt. And there was mm-hmm. a lot of um, Middle East people moving into that area at the time. Uh-huh. And um, yeah. But I didn't know anything about the Middle East at the time. And so I was helping women going through divorce. So, so he came to, comes to me, and he tells me about this woman married to a Muslim man, and that um, she was beautiful, and the, girl, the woman, the wife, American born here and that he didn't know what to do because um, the husband would like beat on her if she did something wrong <laughs> and um, yeah. she was, and she wouldn't file charges because she was scared and um, so um, yeah it was stories it's like not- that that would kind of creep out you know yeah. It's and, not about being happened. scared. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. the way she was brought up that she looks up to the man no matter what, and the man has the right to beat her up and stuff like that. That's the culture. Wow. Uh, I'd have to beat him up, too. <laughs> yeah, the culture here. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm exactly, just joking. Exactly. <laughs> And it's really serious. It was really shocking to me that he was telling me the story that I could do nothing about. But it was really shocking because I didn't know anything about middle, the Middle East at the time. And um, and then there was a neighbor down the street, and they were Middle East from the Middle East too. And um, they, um, the wife told me that they slept in separate bedrooms, and I was kind of shocked. And then she said, I said, really? She said, yeah. And I said, why? And she goes, well, that's part of our culture, our religion or whatever. And and she, I said, oh, <laughs> yeah, if the man wants it's to not... be with me, then he will come into my room. I was like, okay. Well, oh, that's, uh, that's not true. No, that's not true. Really? No, that's, that's not true. That is part of, no. I mean, listen, Rose. This this separation is happening in every household now. After certain years of marriage, the man and the woman they like their own space in the bedroom, <laughs> <laughs> right? In the office in the house in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, know, you, you don't laugh, you know, you're gonna cry. So because you have a very sad story, and uh, it's a but it's a powerful story. And it shows that we are can be survivors because that's what my goal always was, to help victims of injustices become survivors. So I had to become a survivor in order to say, yes, you can become a survivor too. But it's a lot of pain yeah. and heartache and a lot of things that go on that you don't forget about. I mean, you can forgive people, but you you don't forget. But you shouldn't forget because you're going to help other people. If you forgot, you wouldn't be compassionate. And so... Yeah. Um, I'm but sure it, you can feel the pain for all the women in those countries who who are being put, all the young girls too, who are being put yeah. through that position yeah. uh, because yeah. of their culture, civilization, and their laws and politics. So 
Um, what else did you want to tell us about your book, Fate Knocking on My you know, Door? Like, what like, like all this experience I went through, it really uh, made me who I am right now. I am strong. And also there is one thing that uh, life had taught me is that women need to get their education and to get their own earning. They should not ever, ever, ever marry somebody to rely on them to support them financially. They should be on their own. This is the big lesson I took from life and from my experience and from um, um, all the hard ache I went through. I wish all yeah. women will have the opportunity to get an education. It doesn't have to be high education. A- enough education to get them a job, a decent job, to earn their own uh, living, to have their own means of living independently from men. Yes, Layla, because um, in the past in America, um, the women didn't work and they stayed home. They were, you know, stay-at-home moms. They still stay-at-home moms, which is beautiful because children need their mother. I don't care what anybody says. Um, and, you know, if you're not a bad situation, you know what I'm saying, then that's the most important. And so, but the problem is that sometimes men wander and then, and then they don't care about their family anymore. They just wander <laughs> And uh, then they got a new yeah. family. <laughs> and, and, but that's not the way they should do it. They should take care of their family no matter what. Um, you yeah. Know, and, and, but that doesn't always happen. So the women here but, were, like, dependent on their husbands for an allowance. <laughs> you know? yeah. so, but, but, you know, Rose, <laughs> I have a lot of respect for the court here, family court, because they mm-hmm. really – Look after the women. If you are in Egypt and a woman goes to court for uh, child support or for alimony, she can be at the door of that court for years after years because the judge is a man and he is probably doing the same to his to his wife. So that is well, the happens, women in it Egypt. Happens too. It happens here too. Yeah. The courts have changed. Yeah. The courts in America have changed, and um, you, uh, they, a lot of men are like fighting for custody of the kids and the house and throwing the women out in the street. Trust me. And uh, I've yeah. uh, interviewed tons of women, and uh, and it can happen to a man too. But basically, if people would just learn to be fair and honest, you know, I yeah. guess. Be, you know, be it fair does, and honest it, in, in the situation. They they would be so much better off. You know, instead they fight yeah. all this stuff in courts and they're paying tons of money to lawyers. And the only winners are the lawyers and the judge, who sometimes gets a white envelope. So I mean, it, it's it's a sad situation, and these cases can drag out for years. So it 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 just depends if you get a uh, if you get an ethical. Judge, I'm not saying all judges and lawyers, you know, I mean, there's some really great ones, but if if you get an ethical judge who upholds the law and he's objective and fair, I mean, you should just think seriously. Yeah, but still, in, still in America, it's better. I will tell you why. The culture and the misunderstanding of the religion allows the men to, to marry uh, four women. So whenever a woman is calling the, the doctor on the, on the phone and saying, oh, my husband left me, the first thing the woman tell, tell her, oh, we should not approach this subject because God gave him the right to marry four. But God has conditions for a man to marry four. First, he has to ask her. Second, if she has um, a, a terminal illness. Uh, third, if she cannot have children, there is reason. But we, uh, men, they go, they have a woman who is a wife who is devoted, who is beautiful, who is raising her children, and all this. 
And because Mr. reached the age of 50 and he goes through andropause, he goes and marry another girl and, uh, and everybody tells her, oh, he has the right to do that. You see where this uh, chaos in, in Egypt still for women? Oh, that's so sad. I mean, because uh, it's just sad. <laughs> because in our religion, yeah. you know, the Bible, the Christian religion, it's one man and one woman. Then if you yeah. commit adultery, then you can get a divorce, according to our Bible. And uh, yeah. God forgives that. And you can divorce. Uh, but people divorce for all kinds of reasons now. They don't even care why they divorce. But that in the Bible, that's what it says. And so, um, yeah. yeah, so it, it's... Um, that's really sad. I don't. I don't think I could live with the man that had three other wives. <laughs> I mean, the women in Egypt, like if a man is sitting in a cafe, and his friends come over and he tells him, "I am inviting you for a cup of coffee," and his friend says, "No, no, I am not really uh, up to drinking coffee." The, the the guy answers, "I would divorce my wife if you don't sit down." That's how degraded the woman is, you know, in the society, oh in the culture. Wow. That's, so the guy had to really... sit down and drink the coffee because <laughs> <laughs> he swore that he will divorce his wife. It's funny, but it's not funny. I know it's not funny, but in America that sounds really crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, it's sad. It's very sad. I mean, you're going to get a divorce. It is. A it is. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I'm I just never giving an example. Yeah. Really. Yeah, but, I mean, seriously, that is a very serious situation. If the guy didn't sit down and have coffee, now you're getting divorced. Wow. <laughs> oh, my <Yeah>. goodness. <laughs> No, that that tells you how degraded the woman is. It's like yeah. she is like oh, she is like a piece of nothing. Oh, I will throw her out if you don't uh, accept my invitation. You know what I mean? I do. I mean, that's really crazy. I mean, it's just blows my mind right now that that could even happen. <laughs> it's like, why now, are you doing now? You got me into sit down and have a Starbucks culture. <laughs> Now, Rose, you got me to remember all this ugliness of the culture, and now I am upset and my heart is going. I'm sorry. I have a tendency to get people to talk. I try so hard to forget, you know. I love my country. I love my people, but I feel women are really um, not treated uh, the way uh, the religion is telling them to i mean in 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 the prophet was uh, he has um, a, a saying it's called hadith he is urging men before they they um, um, uh, um, uh, the, before they go in bed with their wives they have to do a lot of um, um, you know kissing and hugging and be gentle he he gave them everything about how to treat women, but they don't follow. Well, that happens in America here too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's men are men thing. everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I know now that men are everywhere the same, but with different degrees of um, you know character. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Good thing yeah. that God created. Yeah, God created men and women different, but he, he forgot to put the instructions down in the Bible about that. And you know, <laughs> the older the men they they get, the the less men they become. But women, the older they get, the wiser and the strongest they become. <laughs> Understanding too, it makes you more understanding, and it allows you to open up and be more communicative with the other person, you know, right. and, and 
and sharing more and understanding more and being more of a partner rather than, um, you know, when you're like a teenager, you know, it's like, ah, he's gorgeous. She's gorgeous. Boom. You know, they're, they're in love, you know, yeah. but in the, in the, in the years of learning, which God puts us through, it becomes more, I mean, it becomes more than just, Oh God, he's gorgeous or she's gorgeous. I mean, because you understand that you have to have a friendship. If you don't have a friendship yeah. and you can't laugh together, you can't have something in common that you do together and still have your space to do your thing. There's so much more you exactly. Learn, yeah. You know, and I think yeah. you become a better, a finer person and a more understanding person and more compassionate for your partner than when you're young. You don't. What did you do? <laughs> You know, you don't know. want to listen. You just so yeah, but you know, there's so many similarities though between what is happening to the women in the Middle East, which is uh, a lot worse than happened here. But uh, but still, there's similarities on the fight for women's rights, and that yeah. fight will never go away because it is a man's world. No matter what anybody says, they have the upper hand. Period, and so. You know they're stronger. No, but 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 in <laughs> Egypt, can't. in Egypt, new government with the new president, he hired like three quarters of his cabinet is women, young women, and he has given women a lot of uh, rights and about uh, child support, about everything. He made the great changes, but there is the religious people who are still brainwashing the simple people that this is not right. Yes, I've, I've watched some of the documentaries on that. And, <clears throat> I mean, you guys went through, uh, your country went through a lot yeah. when, um, yeah. they removed, when they removed Mubarak, who was neutral to Israel and America, and, um, but, and they put in Morsi. And I remember there was like 50 million people who were protesting in Egypt. Morsi was a disaster. Nations. Yeah, a total. And, yeah, yeah, he's a total disaster because I read a lot about it, you know, that America shouldn't be supporting Morsi because he is going to kill the Coptic Christians and burn their churches and their homes yeah. and all this. And, and I... I said, you know, America needs to put on their Egyptian red, white, and blue sandals and do the same thing the Egyptians did. When you want a candidate out, take 30 million, 40 million, 50 million Americans and don't leave until they leave. And that's what you guys that's did. That's what they really, really yeah. you. your country for that. Because yeah. the people Why did do we accept? Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, why I do mean, we accept? You are right. You, yeah, your point is 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 well taken because you are right. I mean, I keep saying here, a lot of people are complaining. Why don't you go out, do something about it? Don't complain and mm-hmm. sit and do nothing. Yeah, they like to complain, but then they don't do take action. They don't unite and take action. You know, and so. That's the point. You have to you have to unite. You have to start a movement. Like I started the movement in the 90s, you know, and um, not intentionally. It was a God calling, and because um, I wouldn't have done it if God wasn't calling. <laughs> it was really, really difficult. <laughs> well, then, freaking, Ed Rose, this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to probably they're going to try to kill you or put you in jail and did it just did. I would have said, oh, sorry, God, oh, yeah. I'm not accepting the job, what? you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quitting. I know. I know. <laughs> started, I know. But, but God chooses people, and he chooses people who are naive like me and didn't know what I was getting into. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> no, but you are actually, you are actually for a good cause. <laughs> yeah. And he chose you and your sister because he he knew that you were going to be a survivor and you were going to fight yeah. and you were going to survive. And you were going to become a better person and you're going to share your story with other people. And that's what life's all about, right? That, hey, even though you are having injustices done against you, you can make it. 
You can, yes. I mean, it's hard. It's hard. You have to take baby steps yep. to get in the back to trying to be somewhat normal. But and in the meantime, you can learn so much and you can share that information with other people and make them yeah. know that, hey, you can make it too. And that's what you can yeah. do. With you, can be, you can believe in yourself and, and have mm-hmm. a goal in your life. Believing in right. yourself and believing what you want is is going to happen, then it's going to happen. And it happens, too. I mean, it's so funny because, like, there was things I said, oh, my gosh, you know, like, how am I going to pay my rent, you know, because I had taken care of four kids and I was working, going to court. They had me in all these different lawsuits. <laughs> I was like, they're trying to drive me crazy. And, um, and so... It was the weirdest thing because, like, a check would show up, you know, out of nowhere in a surprise. And I'd be, oh, my gosh, it was exactly what I needed. It wasn't more than I needed, but it was always what I needed. So God always took you care see? of me along the way. Yeah, it was a miracle. Yeah. And so yeah. I think you're a miracle. I think that, you know, what you survived and how you had to escape from that horrible contract. And what you had to yeah. feel when your father told you, hey, <laughs> I just signed a contract. You now belong to this guy here. Uh, I mean, I can't, I can't even imagine that situation because it's so, it's, it's so mind-boggling to, you know, to uh, someone who was born in America to think that the women over in the Middle East have to go through such horrible steps to, you know, to avoid having uh, an arranged marriage. And it's still happening. The sad part of it that I see and I hear that it's still happening. That's what really makes me sad. Like a lot of girls, when they read my book, they, they, they wrote to me and they said, how, how can you help me to, to overcome this. How can I leave? My father is a tyrant. My brother is going to kill me. And I, and I tell them, you know, you, if you feel what you want is right and that's what you want, you have to uh, do it no matter what the consequences is because always the right wins at the end, not the wrong. That's so true, Layla. We're talking to uh, Layla uh, El Sissi, and that's E L and dash S I S S I. Layla's L A I L A. You can Google her name and uh, you'll find her online. And Layla, um, I am so proud of you for uh, writing your books and becoming uh, the, the writer you always wanted to be as a child and for standing up and being brave enough to escape. Uh, That's had to be so, so terrifying for a young teenager to have to leave her family behind and her mother and never see her mother again. I mean, I can't, you know, I can't even imagine such a situation of having to do something like that. And, but yet millions of people have had to do it and they're still doing it like, they did it in 1945 from Germany, and they had to find an exodus and escape from the Nazi Germans. And then they, you have it in other countries where all through history where people had to escape. I mean, and and then some people die along the way, and they lose loved ones and family, friends, and neighbors, and they lose their homeland. And, and so what you, you know, your book says to me is, don't give up. Don't yes. give up. If, if it's wrong, do not give up. And, you know, yes. fight for your your right to be a human being, right? Yeah. Be treated yeah. as a human being and to be treated as a person who has choices and a free will granted by the higher power, whichever religion you believe in, the higher power granted those at birth. And for... You know, for but for so many people, they were terrorized and had to escape their homeland, and and that you know, and things happen. And but there's the survivors, and you're the survivor. 
So if you had one last thing to say to our audience about anything you experienced or from your book and about your book, just go right ahead because now's your time to shine. Uh, Layla, El Sissy, yeah. and it's about uh, where we can find your books as well. Um, my book is on in uh, Ingram, Spark, and Amazon. If anybody is interested to buy them, both of them are there. And please write a review after you read it because it helps me uh, a lot in my, um, as, as they say, grading on Amazon. And also, um, uh, I want to say that when I wrote this book, it was like a healing process. Uh, because up until I uh, wrote the book, both of them, I never really spoke about my experience. So when I put all this in words, uh, I healed myself. I grew up. I matured. I became more confident. uh, And I even um, went and found myself a job, and I found a good job, and I'm still working. And I feel like a brand new person because this was like um, like a heavy load uh, on my heart. And, and when I uh, took this out off of my uh, chest and my, my heart, I, um, I became light. I became happier. I, I became a new person. And uh, hopefully, you know, uh, I have two boys and I raise them completely different than the way the boys are in my uh, back home. So mm-hmm. I am telling all the girls who read my book to, to take me as an example because I did not run away and became a loser. No, I proved to myself first, that I can do it. I didn't need to be following a strict culture. And I proved to my family as well that I I am good. I mean, you wanted to, uh, uh, you know, get rid of me in this marriage, but I fought and I won at the end, and I proved I was right. Yes, you were victorious, and you're a survivor, and you're my friend, and I am proud to know you and happy to know you, and um, we'll have to have you back again. Are you going to write another book? Yes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. We write I'm happy. I'm happy. (laughs) I'm talking to you, Rose, and uh, hopefully we can talk again. Thank you very much for um, asking me to do this interview on your show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your beautiful story with our audience and with me. I always love talking to you, Layla, El Sissy, and Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to go on and get fate knocked on my door, your latest book, and I am going to do yes. a review for you. <laughs> and I want Thank everyone else so to Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you, and we'll, we'll, you keep up the good work. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good luck. Bye-bye. And Layla Al-Sissi, author of Fate Knocked on My Door, has left the building. And be sure to get a copy of her book because it's important to read the stories of how when, you know, uh, you get lemons thrown at you, you need to start making lemonade. And so you know, one of the things you can do is read on how to protect your humanity. Obamasaurus, the new book by Rose M. Colombo, is an updated version of a political satire that reflects the political roadmap of today's world, written with an Orwellian twist. Will humanity survive or suffer depopulation or extinction? Obamasaurus by Rose M. Colombo, available at Amazon.com. Well, my friends, time flies. And now is the time to say goodbye. Thanks so much for being part of the Colombo Chronicles family. You are appreciated. Please do it now. Bookmark. Push that like, share, and follow button. Oh, and don't forget to comment below and stay in touch.
Make your family part of the Colombo family. Until next Wednesday at noon, remember, God loves you, and so does the Rose.